Right now, there's over 30 different funds that generate their income from writing a covered call strategy. And clearly, there is a vast variety of different approaches when it comes to generating a stable income through writing call options. And after you're done combing through all of these different funds, you've most definitely come up with a short list that includes the funds XYLD and QYLD, both of whom on paper appear to be very similar to each other. However, in my opinion, one of these funds absolutely sucks and is a terrible investment, while the other one is a great way for you to generate a stable income. So on this episode of Finance Theory, I am going to be explaining to you why I think XYLD is a significantly better investment than its counterpart QYLD, despite executing nearly identical strategies and having a relatively similar yield. So let's first take a look at the general structure of both of these funds. The first of these being the high yielding NASDAQ 100 covered call ETF, also known as QYLD, which is the larger of these two funds coming in at about $2.6 billion under management. Now the other one is significantly smaller and that being the S&P 500 covered call strategy known as XYLD, whose net assets sit around $250 million. And as their names indicate, these funds are covering two different types of market indexes, QYLD covering the NASDAQ 100 and XYLD dealing with the S&P 500. Now it is also critical to note that the funds option writing strategies are identical. And this strategy is very simple as a whole. In fact, they are so simple, I think someone at home who has a general concept of computer programming could probably whip up the algorithms that these funds are executing in just a few hours. And the reason that their trading strategy is so simple is because they are trying to mimic it after the patterns of normal investors with their whole goal of saving investors times and the potential expense of having to do it on their own. And at an expense rate of 0.6% for both QYLD and XYLD, you can't make a deciding factor based on their strategy or expense ratios. So basically, each of these funds holds a portfolio of stocks that are identical to the market index that they are tracking, and then they write an index call to, to cover 100% of their portfolios with at the month strikes on a monthly basis. And then once that is all set up, all you have to do is wait for the third Friday of the next month, and then repeat the entire process all over again. Now, the key thing to remember in respect to these funds is that the only gains that you generate with the implementation of this covered call is the value of the premiums that are given back when they are sold. With that being understood, let's now get into the most critical aspect of both of these funds, and that is their yield and its sustainability. Now, both of these have exceptionally high rates at 9.6% for XYLD and 11.8% for QYLD. Now, if you compare these funds with the other 30 that I listed at the beginning of the video, you're going to see that the lowest yielding of the Global X funds tops those of the CEF market, and the other two that are listed are in a different class. So this is what makes these funds so appealing because you are able to earn such a high distribution on a monthly basis. But why is the median over double that of the CEF market? Is it because the CEFs are really poorly managed and that they are not able to generate the income of these funds? Or is it that these Global X funds are overpaying their investors because they are not looking beyond the long term of these yields, which are benefiting from a raging bull market and who don't believe that these gains are going to stop anytime soon. You should be pretty inclined to ignore the first option and assume that CEFs are just poorly managed. And many of these CEFs have been around for a long time and with a lot of them having really reputable management styles. However, like all CEFs, their values are bound to change according to the market conditions. So despite their quality, they are not always the wisest decision to make on a new purchase. So although I do seem a little bit cynical of the sustainability of these yields, it does make you wonder why these these funds have been so successful in recent periods. And one of the concerns to this is that it may just be too good to be true because the approach to both of these funds is just so simple. I mean, after all, some of these funds only have as little as two holding types. And I think the reality is that a lot of these funds have really just come at a fortuitous time and that they are benefiting from the raging bull market. So while it is true that both of these funds are generating a wild amount of income, I do think it is necessary to look at the fund's historical performance. However, given the volatility of the indexes they are tracking, and specifically the NDX and RUT, it seems pretty obvious that the exceptionally high levels of dividend yields are only going to be sustainable in the short term. And this is where we are beginning to see why XYLD is pulling ahead. Because without some form of capital base, QYLD is going to have difficulties maintaining that high dividend yield. And as we can see, only XYLD has added capital value since its inception date. And the worst part is, is that QYLD is over six months older and has lost over 12% in its capital value. Despite an extremely strong market that has generated gains of over 300%. And that is double the gains that XYLD's index has generated within the same time period. Now, I would say it's going to be pretty difficult to argue that this fund is not going to be in trouble once the next bear market hits, because that 12% yield is just too high to be sustainable with its current capital depreciation.
appreciation. But this is something that I have already elaborated on in my QILD video. So if you want to know more about the problems with QILD, be sure to check out that video with the link up in the corner. So now let's get into the meat of some of QILD's shortcomings. So up on the screen is a chart of the option month gains and losses from NDX from June 2001, showing the percentage of months the monthly change was at or below the percentage on the X axis. And from the data that was generated on this chart, I've calculated the percentiles of the option month changes. And it's also important to remember here that QYLD is only able to retain option calls generated, can only retain option premiums, and nothing else. And while those losses do retain their premium value, that is exactly what they are, and they are losses on the fund's capital value. So any monthly index losses that exceed the fund's premium are just losses to the NAV. And so far, the median monthly change has been 1.75%. Well, in the same period, the NDX itself was gaining 1.75%. And this means that one third of the time NDX was negative. So while there is not a historical record of the fund's option pricing, we are going to have to make some estimates on those premium calls for ATM calls one month out. And for the coming math here, we're also going to have to assume that QYLD has been maintaining that 12% distribution. And this means that the first percent of premiums does go to shareholders, but losses do retain the entire premium. And losses that exceed the premium are losses to the payout, and losses that are up to the premium amount also add to the diminishing NAV. And if there is a market gain, no matter what size it is, that gain is owed to the call holder, but is offset by the gains of the portfolio. So for this analysis, let's assume that there's an average ATM premium of 2.5%, 1.5 of which is retained by the fund, and the other 1% is given to investors. So since the strike price is at the money, every 1.5% increase adds to the NAV after the distributions are paid out. And market losses that are below 1.5% are extremely devastating to the NAV. And based on the historical data, NDX has lost more than 1.5%, about 28% of the time. And market losses that are less than 1.5% of the NAV do register as a net gain. And then that gain proportionally decreases as we get closer to that 1.5%. So at an average premium of 2.5%, there is a 1.5% gain to the NAV 66% of the time. And then a gain of less than 1.5%, about 7% of the time. And then losses from the NAV maintaining about the other 27%. And you may be thinking that is pretty good because the NAV is generating capital about 67% of the time. However, you have to remember that the losses here are basically unlimited. Well, there is a capped upside. If there is a loss of negative 4.5% or more, then at the very least, you're going to negate three months of upside. And this is something which has occurred 16% of the time or two months on average a year. And then a loss of greater than 7% has occurred about once per year. So we can see that when the bull run comes to the end for NDX, this is going to have devastating effects on QYLD, making it impossible for it to maintain this super high dividend yield. Now, all this is important to say because when investing in QYLD, most investors out there are predominantly concerned about generating that income. And it's been a good run for QYLD, but because it is going to lose so much of its nav when the market drops, that is something that is not going to be sustainable. And for this reason, I think if you are still looking for a covered call strategy that still presents the opportunity to maintain its value during a bear market, then XYLD is a better option, even though right now it does have a slightly lower dividend yield. So that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Why don't you hit both those like and subscribe buttons on the way out of here. And with that being said, guys, I will see you in the next one.